Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm now on the right side of the screen, uh, coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. Got Mark Fielding across the pond. Mark Fielding, how are you, sir? I am excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, winter has dropped here. Snowboarding season is literally a week away. I'm very excited to get on the snow, but almost as excited am as about today's show. So um, I know we're a bit late for our audience. Apologies for that. No small talk, no chit chat. Quick word from our sponsors. Then we'll introduce our guest, Jeremy. Amazing. Yes. A quick shout out to our great sponsors. Um, Ripple with a WWRIPPLE marketing's on demand talent platform. Brilliant community of 300 plus vetted freelancers in many disciplines. A lot of big brands working with this company, Delta, Equifax, AT&T. So if you've got a project in the fourth quarter, need some help need some talent, check out ripple.com. Without further ado, Mark, introduce our guest and let's jump right into this fun discussion. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, unless you've been living under a rock for the last five years, if you have any connection to Web3, blockchain, crypto, the metaverse, you know Sebastian Bourget. Everyone's here to see him. Yeah, co-founder of The Sandbox, um, president of the Game Blockchain Gaming Alliance, um, and world proponent of blockchain technology, Sebastian Bourget. Bienvenue eh, pour nos amis français. La première question, la question la plus importante, comment ça va? Ça va très bien, merci. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. I'm all great. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to unpack a lot today. We want to get into the sandbox. We want to get into the brand activations. We want to get into the games. We want to get into blockchain. We want to get into all of it. But for thinking on paper, I think most of our audience see you traveling around the world and how, how many countries have you visited this this year do you know how many countries you visited this year i, I don't know but I, I feel one passport and i'm on the second so <laughs> yeah in just a matter of months i think i've done six seven countries and well truth is like i don't spend a lot of time in each one of them but like i make most of the time here matter connecting with the community and the creator on the ground and it's true that what we are building and powering creators it reach out like really a world without frontiers it's really a very global value proposition and it's exciting to see that like we have communities in so many different places including asia latam um, of course europe and now like even mina region quick quick question on the communities really quick so you've got there are two pieces to them right they're the creators and then the people who participate in the communities that are created and you've been across the world where are you seeing the most interesting pockets of people being really, really excited uh, about what's happening? Like that surprised you, like you got into a country and you're like, wow, we've got a thousand people really excited about this. Like where, where, where have you been surprised with these communities geographically? So the first thing to consider is like we're putting a major emphasis on creator first at Sandbox, even though our platform can gather to like brands, to uh, players, and also potentially to, to investors via real virtual real estate, like the most important category for us in 2024, as we announced in our first uh, global creator day in Hong Kong will be the creators. And we put a big focus on that community and all the tools and product we provide to empower them. And uh, reaching out to like those global communities around the world. I've been very surprised by like how dynamic uh, like Thailand was, uh, Turkey was, and also like other region of the world. More recently, we visited Philippines as well, where we we're seeing already a great amount of uh, artists and, and studios uh, there. We've been seeing yeah, uh, even like more like known geographies like Korea, Japan that are already established in video game. I think that's also the part of the beauty of Web3. It's really like leveling up everyone and enabling like new uh, people to enter the field, to enter this industry, to become a creator, even though they were not uh, part of like the previous Web2 or gaming free-to-play revolution. And in, in, in those, those communities, is there a, a different approach? Is Does the excitement come from a different place? Is everyone just excited for the gaming aspect or for others the the still the crypto aspect of it or the, the community aspect of it is is the, does that vary across cultures 
I do think it varies indeed uh, across uh, culture. Like some markets are indeed more interested on the financialization aspect and like uh, what traditional ownership means in terms of monetization, while some others are really excited by just like the creative side and the ability to like with this no code game maker that is, that is part of the sandbox platform to express their idea, to live, to let their imagination go live to bring their culture, their heritage, uh, their landmark and many things that's part of like uh, well, that, their, the, that culture in general and build something that is much more than gaming. So that's also something we, we say quite often at Sandbox, we're not creating a gaming platform, we're creating um, like a virtual world with a map where people are connecting around new uh, a new form of entertainment. It's a mixture between social, cultural and gaming activation. And, and the truth is like, if you were to think Sandbox just as a game, it will be very poor in terms of feature. Of course we improve, etc. but we are definitely not competing with your traditional AAA game or the standards of gaming. We might get there in five, 10 years and it keeps improving year to year, specifically with the new release we're having at the end of this year. But if we look at what Sandbox is, it's a new form of entertainment. It's very social people come to connect to make friends to chat to interact with the avatar to express themselves and you can encounter experiences that is around art sport fashion music uh, media entertainment uh, museums culture etc and that's quite unique and not found on other platforms so stepping back just to, just a bit i mean obviously sandbox was one of the first to come out with with this philosophy and with this you know ability to create digital experiences and connect digital experiences uh very early on in 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 the web3 even kind of pre web3 what were the what what were some of the early lessons that you learned once you put this thing out there that uh that maybe were different from what you thought the vision of it might be Yes, yeah, so, so we've been having the vision of like Sandbox since we started actually in 2011. Back then it was just a mobile game. We really wanted to empower anyone to become a creator, leveraging new technology and making it as accessible to, pos to, to everyone as possible. Actually relates to my own story. Like I always wanted to make video games, but creating games like this is like um, a technical software. You need like to have programmers, you need to have like very specialized uh, teams and hardware to be able to do it. So how do you democratize game making and smartphone with just their the touch screen actually were a very interesting and novel way to interact. Uh, like by the touch of your finger, you drop pixel and you can share online creation with others. That's how Sandbox started. And it keep evolving uh, until like five years ago, we found about blockchain NFTs as a technological solution to actually not only uh, let uh, creators make their own content, but also like be able to monetize it freely the way they want it. And it's been really driven by this ID and it keeps being driven by this ID today. Like how do we bring new creators, new talent from all around the world to express themselves? The second thing that worked really well, and maybe we, we didn't plan for it at the beginning was this virtual map that we introduced. It's a finite map of 166, 164, lands and in total not a single more it's backed by the smart contract and that map is actually the way you're going to discover uh, the games the experiences uh, on the platform and it has something very unique which is like the fact that we can be neighbor to each other and so it becomes a new social discovery layer where uh, your location will matter and instead of like setting out the whole map at the beginning, like some other uh, virtual world have done, we've done it in a way that we curated progressively different neighborhoods, either by thematic or by region of the world. And we've seen a strong uh, like appetite, interest for people to be part of that social discovery layer, to become the virtual neighbor of their favorite celebrity or to be part of the Turkish verse, the Thai verse, Singapore verse, Barat box for India, those neighborhoods that are created by culture or uh, geographical region of the world. And it creates a new link between all the virtual neighbors that are supporting each other, that are part of that community or sub-community to create something that will be relevant, matter, drive traffic and support each other as well. Like, the second that thing a... that we saw, uh, oh, sorry. 
I was going to, so that's what I've seen with Cinerama Land, which you have the exactly. cinema land where you can, yes. if you're a, a film writer, you can go and get a piece of land by Lionsgate. I don't know, maybe have some actors nearby and use that exactly. energy to create. Yeah, you, you could actually get a land anywhere as a screenwriter, as someone who is inspired by movie to make your own experience. But actually, Cinerama is probably one of the best locations because it's, uh, it's connecting people who share that same interest, that same thematic, and putting them together in one neighborhood. And we've done that with music, with Infinite Pulse, with gaming, with Voxel Madness, and with other land sales earlier. Actually, we've done eight successful land sales uh, this year. And we are planned to, uh, we also had like a, a Korea verse one and two, Mega City for Hong Kong and Greater China, Turkish verse, Lion City for Southeast Asia. And we're going to have eight more next year, similarly around specific thematic or region of the world. The second thing that really uh, came, maybe we didn't plan for it ahead, but we saw like the, the rising importance of digital identity, like avatars, those simple game characters that we create. Like if you've been playing video games, this is always the starting point. Like every RPG, MMO, kind of game, even you have, you buy a Nintendo 3DS Switch, you start by creating your character there. But we saw like the importance of the rising importance of the avatar as you keep that digital identity as you play across all those different experiences around the map. That's what connects you, that define you. And in Web3, you own that avatar as an NFT. And also it shows which community you're part from. And Partnering with major celebrity and brands, we launched 19 official collection of avatars I don't, with, with uh, Paris Hilton, Gordon Ramsay, Snoop Dogg, Care Bears, Rabbits, etc., which sold out. And also, uh, we enabled people to play with their avatars from other projects in Web3, other communities as well, giving them suddenly uh, a creative platform, uh, a space where they can interact with their avatars not just like most community how they interact is discord or telegram it's like a 2d channel where you have only message going up and down in channels now you can interact in 3d world you can express yourself you can connect you can play you can create together and expand that universe it's a very exciting value proposition that's at driving more and more users into metaverse and sandbox too dead fellas that's the community they, they you can have the it is one of the very engaged it's a great example and dead fellas uh, not only started as an NFT uh, collection, but then uh, we we make those 2D profile pictures become 3D characters in very creative ways. We added animations, and then we launched a contest called the Game Jam, where participants from the community could also make their own games. So start invents the universe, the experience of that community. And then we also had rewards for those creators. We had rewards for the players who use that avatar as they play the Dead Fellas experience, but not only, also when they play all the rest of the events that the platform has. So in a way, it's been driving a lot of value and new possibilities for that community, that project that grew stronger and, and grew bigger thanks to that as well. Yeah, play, placemaking uh, has kind of been a, a theme just on the physical real estate side, right? Even or, originally it happened kind of organically when the artists would kind of get together in certain pockets of cities and that sort of thing. And then developers got onto this idea to say, Hey, you know, we we're building this building. We're redoing this building. We want to bring in little pieces of the puzzle and then let them act and engage organically, which it sounds like this is a very interesting digital transformation uh, of that, I'm curious how the interaction has been across communities, right? So say I have Atlanta, Georgia, US community and Mark has like music community, right? He's got a music community. Is, is there a way to measure interaction between communities and how has that been going? So, so there's very, very many different ways that communities actually uh, have been like interacting. Like, first of all, like, with your avatar, like you choose and you show which is, I don't know, your favorite community, etc. But then you use that avatar to explore other projects, other brands, other communities' experiences as well. And then you start connecting and it creates a world which is almost like a Disneyland theme park where you start crossing all those different characters from various community. And it's a beautiful melting pot. It's something that, again, like really reflects 
uh, like the beauty of the metaverse we as a very inclusive world with people like having their own choosing their identity and those community crossing uh, in different experiences second thing is like many projects as well like when you build an experience you can uh, you can make all the 3D content yourself with a 3D or Vox Edit, or you can buy NFTs from other uh, collection brands and community, and you can use those NFT into your own land. So somehow, like a fan of uh, Snoop Dogg could buy a Snoop car, put it on his own land, even though that game was differ very different. And it's something that we've done a lot. Like not only uh, creators are building their own experience with our game maker. But Sandbox itself has been producing many experiences from the, some of the four red top brands that we partner with. And we always make sure we include other characters, other NFTs, other art and NFT art in those experience to allow people who are not yet familiar with those community, with the notion of uh, NFTs, crypto art, to discover that. Putting and, and that's why it's more than game because I can actually just complete one quest or the quest and go through it. But you can also spend your time to explore, to look around, to be amazed by the art, to discover new talent and artists, to be inspired actually, and even to find new communities to connect with. Uh, looks like okay. which, there you which go. one are you going to join? Jeremy, which, which community? What, what have you got your eye on? Well, you know, I thought might be the the opportunity of like, I've always thought, cause I come from a music background, you know, doing music for film and television, video games, that sort of thing. And um, there's a tremendous opportunity to figure out the music problem in virtual worlds, right? So you have agencies and organizations that are kind of older and, um, you know, professional rights or performing rights organizations are you starting to see people figure stuff like that out in the digital space? So imagine if there's music playing, right? And there's an artist and it's in your world, but maybe it's in a common area between our worlds, right? There's like a path between our worlds. Are you seeing anyone kind of figuring out the music thing in this space, whether it's discovery or, or performing rights or, or all of that stuff? So, so there's different read levels to see like how we interact with music in the metaverse. The first one is typically fan engagement. Like you like a certain uh, category of music or, or like certain artists and you want to like create a new bond in the virtual world with them. And it's true that at Sandbox, we, we have a lot of uh, music celebrities uh, like Snoop Dogg. We have DJs like Steve Aoki or Paris Hilton and um, even music labels like Warner Music, uh, which introduced new experience to discover existing talent like um, or, or uh, new talent. We also were to define uh, like how, what does it mean to like uh, discover music into an experience? So yes, those experience feature some of like soundtracks and, and sometimes even exclusive uh, content released by the artist, thinking about Agoria, thinking about Blondish as well as DJs. Uh, thinking about uh, Baby Yours, which is like a, a, a LGBTQ plus music artist from the US who've been leveraging Metaverse, launching his experience, and even using Metaverse in his own music clips. Um, or even For Eve, a band from Thailand, a girl's band from Thailand, from Thai pop that launched an experience and first concert in Sandbox. Or uh, SM Entertainment launching the SM Palace in Korea. So many different ways. Um, we try to keep it on the creative side. Like what does it mean for fan engagement? What does it mean for people to explore a new world inspired by the music of their favorite artists? Whether it's like bringing to life uh, the music clip itself or like a very magical scenery, visiting the house of your favorite artist. Like you could play in Steve Aoki house or Snoop Dogg compound in LA, which is very hard to access in the physical world. Like uh, so few people can do that, but now with metaverse, everyone can do that. That's exciting. and even be elevated thanks to the technology. Um, connect and support your artists by uh, owning the NFT and getting sometimes like fees, uh, reward, access to VIP event, digital, et cetera, as well. Like we, we've seen that. On the, phys on the music rights side, I still think it's uh, um, definitely a complex world. And you still have, like you said, to navigate with uh, performance rights, uh, author rights and so on. We actually work very closely uh, with 
uh, our agent, the team, and to make sure that we clear all the rights so we can use those music in the experience and allow even creators to use them. Recently, uh, Avenged Sevenfold, for example, launched a game jam and they made some of their music available for the fan to use within the experience co-created with their community, which is quite exciting. And sometimes we're even thinking, how can we write new songs together? Like Snoop Dogg created a new song called The House I Built, uh, inspired by his land and his house in Sandbox. Uh, we're thinking, how can DJ collaborate across uh, like uh, different metaverse uh, brands, etc. So we're, we're looking at all the possible angles because we think there is so much innovation and thing that can be done still now that you leverage user generated content and the technology. Yeah, and it's a big theme, Mark, that you and I talk about nearly every week is this this participatory access, this uh, ability for fans and artists to kind of merge in this in this world where they get to do a little bit more than just kind of sit there and, and listen to a broadcast, right? But, all, all, but also something like the grassroots, what, what particularly interests me here is, uh, um, I, I, I I think Snoop Dogg's amazing, but I don't know how much time he's actually spending in, in the sandbox or in these virtual platforms, but new small bands built around a community can use the sandbox and they can use these platforms mm -hmm. to make music and to get their music out there. And I think it, I love the energy of these Web3 technologies for the grassroots. And I know that you need you 2 and you need these huge big household names to create the flywheel to get the smaller musicians interested but once they're in i think that's for me is much more interesting and that co-collaboration between big bands and community can then create other bands that perhaps pop up because of that and that's and that's the same for writing art anything else movie making that's happening on the platform Right. We're not replacing existing platforms. We're more complementary to them and offer yeah. different ways to engage and fans, fan group to think about, to, to shape and think about it. Um, what does it mean to be a fan today? Like how many times you listen to a song, how much uh, you attend to the concerts of that artist? Like how do you support them? Like uh, writing message, uh, like sharing their news on your social network, etc. But that's, probably new action you can do with uh, within a virtual world where you can also discover more about themselves, be present, uh, help to grow their community, own virtual asset that you put on your avatar to represent the artist uh, as well and make him, him or her or the group discovered, uh, expanding their horizon. And because Sandbox has a global uh, community of players, like not just US or Europe, but actually 31% in Asia, 30% in Europe, 20 plus percent in the US that give access to a lot of artists as well to a wider distribution and discovery on our platform. Okay, thank you. Um, go for it, Jeremy. Oh, I was just thinking, you know, part of, part of what makes, you know, experiences a little bit more human is, is obviously the, the physical nature of them, right? You know, when, when we're in a room together, the three of us, it's going to be a different experience than, you know, the three of us, you know, seeing each other's videos, although we're getting more and more comfortable with, with, with seeing some of that stuff. Have you thought about uh, kind of a strategy that kind of brings in like IRL events and locks into what you guys are doing uh, from digital experiences, like almost like a portal, like live portals into what's happening in your world? We, so we'll be definitely running around with our avatar, maybe chasing to each other. Think of it of a playground. While we talk, we can do like more things than just sitting straight in front of a camera. And that's pretty fun. That's part of like what creates memories and connections together as well. Uh, we've seen many ways, that, like because we're still early stage in the metaverse, like people are putting a lot of like uh, creativity and, and like they are innovating. And what we are seeing typically in Asia, for example, is like a lot of the brands and partners who are launching, they don't just launch a virtual experience. They actually try to connect it with a physical a form of physical experience, whether it's like a pop-up store, it's a special activation where you can come and scan yourself to get your avatar, claim NFTs. Uh, we had a uh, theme park like Lotte World. We had um, in Korea, sorry, the largest indoor theme park um, in Korea. We, we've had like Warix in Thailand that launched an experience where um, uh, you play in the game, you win a reward, and you can claim like a special collector jersey. 
we had experience where you visit a virtual museum with some of the most uh, renowned art piece that came to life. Think like Mona Lisa or like Starry Night by uh, Van Gogh and also new talented artists from Thailand. And people, 100 first people who complete quest get free tickets to actually a museum or like a video game conference called the Thailand Game Show. Uh, we've had exposition around Ink Asia that had both physical exhibit and metaverse exhibit to enlarge and make people more discover, disco more people discover more the special art form, etc. Uh, we had new art contest as well, live uh, happening. So, so it's quite interesting to see how people are leveraging those different possibilities. Um, and I think like, as we provide new tools and we keep updating the tools on the sandbox platform, we'll see more and more innovation and fun possibilities, things that we want that will make us come back, not just once, but like come back quite regularly in those spaces as well and building progressively those audience and uh, patterns of behaviors for people to spend even more time in the metaverse. Is this like in a recent, I think it was on Cointelegraph, you, you kind of acknowledged that metaverse, should we still be using the word metaverse? Actually, that's another question, but metaverse adoption won't explode until these use cases are more, well, more fun, more engaging, more entertaining. Is, is So these are the steps to that kind of metaverse. It, it, it's very important to stay attached to, to like the utility, the experience, the user experience, what's, what they can do with the avatar, what they can do with their NFT and make sure that like it's something unique, fun, replayable that will draw and drive and grow audiences. We're seeing um, already some great signs of progress. This year we, we move, we increased 20% our audience uh, to 5 million users with the wallet. We've seen people spend 62 minutes on average on a daily basis when they engage in sandbox. That's a 20% year on year increase. So definitely the more you provide uh, possibilities to the creators to make fun things, to make new things, to make multiplayer and social things, to improve the level of immersion by combining different art form, video, photo, music, NFTs, uh, audio and video streams, etc. The more it will develop and engage uh, it. And, and at the core, there's still this very basic idea, like you need more content to explore. Like if you compare the metaverse as to like, the internet, like you need million, hundred of million of websites for people to go spend on time, etc., to develop. And uh, yeah, I think metaverse is still a, a great term, term to use. Like even though um, it was really brought up to light around November 2021 when uh, Facebook rebranded itself as Meta, even though it, Meta isn't really using metaverse anymore, you're seeing Roblox using uh, Epic with Fortnite and the UEFN, like actually drive and use that term more and more. And they are interesting because they are doing it in, the, in a way that is more aligned with the, the, the vision and the definition we have, which is like those virtual world platform, which is a heavily user-generated content. So they are not doing it with a commercial intent to sell more VR headsets for their own purpose, but they are really pushing a vision where like, the future of our social interaction, the future of uh, gaming is going to be heavily user-generated content and leveraging that and and offer us experiences that are avatar-based. Um, so, sorry, Jamie, did you have a question? No, go ahead. Um, I was, I, I wanted to ask about the brand, some actionable advice for brands because a lot of our audience is on LinkedIn and I, I'll come to that, but, but you just, you mentioned Roblox and Fortnite and I think when I first saw you on stage at Vivitech I asked about interoperability and do you ever see or do you see um, the sandbox being interoperable with platforms like Roblox and Fortnite and what that interoperability might look like or feel like or so I wouldn't say never like definitely there's like step forward from all the actors to be part of like working group and association such as the Metaverse Standard Forum on the OMA3, the Open Metaverse Alliance to try to define um, many ways to enable that interoperability that could be around the file formats, like using Voxel, VXM file, GLTF, using USD for universal scene descriptor. It's a quite technical low level thing, but that's still 
mandatory because if we cannot interpret the format of data that we use across each other, that's already an issue. Then there are more advanced things like how do you bring your avatar as your digital identity across different platforms. The challenge uh, that still exists and that is partially solved by the technology, one technology at least, which is blockchain, is how do you allow uh, a, a user uh, content, such as an avatar, to be used and connect across different applications or platform or services. Well, blockchain facilitate that because it puts the ownership back into the user, so the user they decide where it connects, etc. Versus more centralized platform will need to rely on APIs or other things which are more prone to uh, less trust, less uh, transparency, potential change at any point of time, uh, no ritual compatibility and things like that. Still, I think that the intention uh, that all the platform have showed is to support the technology that allows users to own their data over time. And we can see, we hopefully will see maybe in five, 10 years, uh, definitely more concrete application of that. In the meantime, in a decentralized world, that is already happening to some extent. The voxel content, uh, sorry, the content you make in Sandbox that is represented in voxel can already be used across a large range of other decentralized virtual world. You can play with your avatars in Sandbox, but also in AR games, uh, AR apps, uh, uh, and uh, other like uh, web-based platform and so on. And it's quite exciting to to see that. Yeah, it is exciting. It is. Yeah, it's interesting too on on the interoperability side. It it comes down to like rigging tech too, like it, with the experiences too. Like everyone has kind of a uh, a way they rig animation array, a way they set up their experiences, and a lot of them. The whole it's it's a mindset too because platforms want people to come onto their platforms and stay on their platforms because there's time energy creative dollars like invested in them right so uh, you know it, it it tell me about like what kind of paradigm shift just from a philosophical standpoint needs to happen or if there does if it does need to happen to get us all connected it will need to happen at some level to, to like make sure we all use the same standard that we all use the same uh, way to interpret the data or understand what it's an avatar is what is like i don't know like an equipment a skin uh, what's representing a world and what's in this world and so on and that's why those working groups are happening and uh, definitely like people are trying to put standards that are not owned by a single company but that will be embraced by a whole ecosystem Overall, like the bigger vision is like, how do you create a, a true digital economy and a creator economy is you will do that once like all the value that what people purchase doesn't just sink into one single platform and is being captured by the operator of that platform, but uh, that value can build up at the user level. And almost like in the real world, as a citizen, I have my bank account and I can travel across country and my money hopefully doesn't get reset to zero every time I change a country. <laughs> just put things simply in perspective like which same should happen in digital worlds that makes a whole lot of sense we got a great question from our audience so we we've got uh nearly 800 live attendees in this um so uh you know you've you've definitely brought brought the crowd today one one fun question was um is the real estate agents so this is interesting right because the human experience of buying land requires an intermediary that knows the area that knows the stuff that can do a little bit of hand holding are you do you have some kind of concierge type system that mimics that we've seen that because it's like a decentralized ecosystem where lands is part of that infrastructure that we can sell land ourselves during the land sale that's called the primary sale and then lands become available for owners to actually buy and sell on the secondary market, either by themselves on like a marketplace like OpenSea, think of it like eBay or Zillow of virtual real estate, or uh, on, um, uh, on other websites. Like some people have made a business to become like virtual real estate agent, connecting offer and demand, looking at more sold parcel, more premium parcel closely located to certain celebrities like Snoop Dogg or Warren Music or uh, Walking Dead, Ubisoft and so on. Uh, we also saw people whose business is to buy larger pot of land and start curate and bring their own brands into it and potentially 
lease it while they will be helping people to publish and so on. We've seen the Metaverse Index Funds based also acquiring land and token from different platforms and offering that as a financial product. We've seen first like virtual real estate fund as well, like people buying properties and repackaging it and offering um, and it's a financial product that's being recognized. And why all of that is possible? Because first, like it is decentralized. Second, like there is enough liquidity uh, and volume of transaction on those on most of the largest platforms that use it. And there is a strong utility attached to it, just like in the physical world, if an empty real estate will probably not grow in value. If you start to build a business, to bring the traffic, etc., that value could potentially appreciate more. And people understand that pretty well already because they've seen that in the physical world, like how like the largest metropolis have grown and because they, brought, they, are, they are very attractive hubs that bring like education, work, uh, all the different facilities that and around entertainment, etc., that tend to grow and make those places more attractive. And when you think about virtual world, those are places that are capable of drawing million to hundreds of millions of users on a daily basis to connect, to interact, to spend time, to buy more virtual items than sometimes physical goods. And that's why that the whole industry and ecosystem is prone to, to grow bigger and bigger. And at the heart of it is virtual land. That's like the location where those experiments are being published. On, on that note, so we have again we have quite a lot of people working for brands listening to this and they don't work for the big brands but i think their interest has been sparked by virtual land and by the metaverse and by web3 gaming if and like something actionable if i if i'm if i own my own brand i want to get involved but i don't know where to begin where do i begin where would where would they begin so th there's so many different ways like, like definitely looking at um like just trying the platform, trying to access it, play with an avatar, being inspired by what other brands have done, because we're no longer in a phase where it's just like theory, like four and red brands have partnered with Sandbox, have acquired land, some of the largest world brands in values thematic or from music, uh, with Warner Music, Steve Aoki, Snoop Dogg, uh, and a few others, from movies with Cinerama, as you mentioned, from Fashion with Gucci, Charlie & Keith, Lacoste uh, have entered Sandbox launch experience. Even brands like McDonald's have launched quite interesting, innovative experiences, education and so on. And you can like see what they've done, be inspired and like then uh, either like try to build all by yourself internally, like having the right uh, artist, game designer, level designer and, and learning the tools. Or you can rely on one of the 250 plus trusted agencies, which are really acting like your uh, digital and media agency that will like advise you on the strategy, what to put and can build for you as well, uh, those experiences. And we created that trusted partner program that now counts over 250 um, agencies and studio around the world, which we train of like what Sandbox can do and cannot do. Uh, inspire them with workshop, provide them all the case study and data so they can themselves better educate and bring on their client. Some of them include Avast Media, Influential, uh, Publicis, and then like smaller, more boutique agencies as well, uh, located in Hong Kong, like Index Game, Pengu, uh, by Kennel, or in other regions. So you can choose to work with a big one, with a smaller one closer to where you're actually based and, and have human interaction to build that experience and learn more about web free and um, the metaverse. There you go. So if you have a brand and you want to get in the sandbox, now you know exactly how to do it. No excuses. Um, at the beginning of the, the chat, you mentioned an update at the end of this year. Um, can, can you can you talk about that update? Um, yes, absolutely. Is that the so, at all or, well, yeah, what, there's what, many things that actually, so at the beginning of the month, uh, November 3rd, we hold our first like uh, global creator day in Hong Kong. We brought our uh, community uh, creators, brands, partners of over 1,000 onto a one dedicated day, day. And then during that day, we had a few announcements. We announced that by the end of this year, we'll be launching a new game maker that adds a lot of like um, better performance, better graphic, new uh, multiplayer uh, capability to drive more fun.
more social uh, features, and that is going to be. Uh, uh, we announced that we'll be opening the marketplace of Sandbox. So, uh, people can start creating their own and uh, selling their asset directly by themselves. We are not opening uh, publishing, so any of the landowners can open an experience without any prior validation, and that has led to over 260 experience to go live right away. And we hope to have thousands of experience go live, more content to explore, more time to spend, more chance to engage or even monetize. Um, and we introduce also um, the fact that Sandbox will be coming to mobile by the end of 2024, showcasing a little bit about what we have right now. It's something we've been working for over a year already with Unity. Uh, we have, uh, uh, introduce a new uh, game maker fund that supports creators from all horizons to publish their experience and also as they bring their community and uh, users to engage on the platform uh, with a reward pool that will be distributed following the same model as Apple Arcade or, or, or Roblox or Fortnite, for example. Many other announcements, uh, but yes, like very excited to to make 2024 the year of the creators and to use those creators to support brands, innovators in many ways. One, for example, your brand, you don't, you will, you don't know what to build or you build something, but you can leverage that community of creators, launch a contest and have then hundred, if not thousand of content being made for you by those creators. And you pick up the winner and you can host the winner on your own land, which is very valuable combination then of like, a presence in a decentralized platform, user-generated content, and also like engaging through that. So that, that's one of the exciting things we also shared on Mo that Mo moment. Mobile gaming is going to be uh, brilliant. Can I just like ask on the content creation, so now gamers, um, landowners are free to launch their experience. Is so a lot of the fear mongering about the metaverse was about these decentralized platforms where there's no holds, no holds barred and anything goes. Is there any, is this a community led, not censorship, that's the wrong word, but um, to make sure that people don't release content that is not suitable for minors or is hate speech or is, is there anything in, in, in the system to, to monitor that? The, the it, we, we, it's very important to have a moderation system in place and a, a review of what's happening. And we can rely on both on the technology to have automated moderation already, thanks to AI, whether it's like in-game chat conversation or review of like what could be inappropriate. And also the, the, the power of the crowd, so the community, yeah. like, like they report things they feel are inappropriate or might not be uh, official. And, and then uh, our moderation team is actually taking action. It's a bigger problem in general in the industry. We know it's been requiring like a massive manpower until like the recent rise of AI and its progress. And it's not something that uh, uh, until today has been done perfectly. Nobody can say we're doing percent perfectly. There's always a way to, to keep improving, but everyone is driven by that desire and that direction. Okay. Yeah, it's so it's interesting. Theory, where did you go? You, I think you cut out. Oh, I jumped into the metaverse for a second. Um, no, this is super interesting. Sebastian, so a lot of what you are doing uh, rings true to a lot of themes we've been exploring over the last year, or Mark and I individually by ourselves for many years, but kind of together in this format. One of them is emergent systems and hierarchical systems and how how successful things have a little dash of both, right? So how do you balance kind of a hierarchical structure in your organization, but also letting it do what it needs to do from the from the bottom up, from the community up, not the bottom up, from the community level up necessarily? How do you balance those two things? So ultimately the sandbox will be fully decentralized. The goal is to put in place Call, something called a DAO, a decentralized finance organization, where like the community of our landowners, uh, players, creators, sand holders will get to decide more and more and vote on key decisions. But this is a progressive plan. So instead of like decentralizing right from the beginning, we put in a place in plan that we shared in our white paper that over five years will go step by step. And it started right now, we still uh, majority even though you have already some decentralized uh, content like land like sand token like avatars and uh, digital assets 
the rest is, is still operated uh, the way we decide the prices of the platform, the features we launch, etc. Of course, we've been in user generated content, uh, uh, my, my co founder, Archer Madrid, and myself for over since 2011, so 12 years already. We know how to interact with community. We talk to creators, we use their feedback and we, we prioritize it in the product roadmap to make sure that what we ship is actually aligned with what they want to do or what they feel like when is needed, is missing based on their ideas. Uh, and in the future, that will become a process where we are less and less involved and definitely like one or multiple decentralized uh, entities or group could actually help to run curate, bring new creators, decide how the rewards will be distributed among them, uh, decide what event, festival, contests are being organized, which brand to go, which market to prioritize, and so on and so on. So it's, it's quite exciting to think how it will evolve as well, in general, toward that direction. Yeah, that, that is, it's exciting. Um, and it's, it's going to be fascinating because you are, Sandbox is perhaps going to be the the ultimate experiment for that to see how what can be achieved with a DAO on the blockchain with with such a huge product community um, and amount of experiences and brand there's so many people involved now who have skin in the sandbox game if you like like 400 brands global superstars so it's going to be fascinating no pressure Sebastian sorry to uh... <laughs> So well, well I, we, we hope to do interesting things. It might not be at, at the beginning, like at the beginning of every DAO, there's always things related to its own DAO administration and council and things to vote. But progressively, we hope that we'll infuse that creativity and that power that actually benefit everyone on the platform and, and allow them to take decisions first for the benefit of platform, the platform itself and not their self-interest. I think it, I think it was really a, a good play to 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 start the way you did and let it evolve the way it's evolving instead of right off the right off the jump being like, hey, here's our DAO, here's what we're doing, and all of that because DAOs have gone through a bunch of experiments and iterations, and you know the idea of what I call spectral leadership is is not as digestible as a hierarchical leadership. When I mean spectral leadership, like we're say we're in a DAO, the three of us, and there's a project where my skill set is better suited than yours i would kind of emerge in this spectrum of like hey i'm going to drive the ship for the next 20 days because i've experienced this and then i can kind of step back and this whole ebb and flow are how, how do you see that i guess in a decentralized community that that mindset is already there but are you how do you see leadership in 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 DAOs? Well, well, I think like the first thing, or how I see it is like one day there will be a simple vote. Like, do you still want Sebastian to kind of like represent or do anything at Sandbox? And if I don't do a good job that like benefit the community and the platform, like someone else could come up and be elected. We've seen that many times in other MMORPG or, or virtual world games that tend to live long time, 20, 25, 30 years for things like... Uh, for, for a second life or, or and others and they evolve into political system you have people that come and support others that vote there's council there's uh committees that review what you've done and you have to you are uh, responsible for like your action you're responsible for like did you deliver on your agenda and if not you will be replaced by someone else and people get more and more educated as well to what like what are the um, the realistic uh, budget what are the realistic action that can be uh, done and driven uh, by it so so in that sense I, I feel like this um, we're still early stage keep in mind that sandbox is only five years old but it might evolve and, and that's all the best we can wish in a situation where other people could uh, represent and and work for the greater good of the whole platform and that's not only the core team that's been building sandbox awesome. Thank yeah you. i think one, one of the quick things and i know we want to be mindful of time too i could talk about DAOs for you know hours but the Don't the idea yeah i won't i won't no just just the idea of like um i think the missing link in DAOs. what i've seen is like the ability to quantify and acknowledge meaningful participation right because people who put 
free work into something they're they do it because they love it but you know if they don't get that nod and elevation of like hey you you know i see you busting your butt you know sebastian to build something that just because you love it you know for you to be elevated that's when things get really cool and you know dean wilson we had on the show dead mouse's manager talked about elevating people in their discord they've been doing it for years to, into these super fan manager positions and i think that's going to be really the key um to 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 see all of that um mark any final you got hot buttons for for our guest today where I how have, do we want to wrap this up i haven't got a hot button but i, I do I, I appreciate thank you for your time and I, we probably have to jump off um just what i've got two short questions one is what's your favorite experience on the sandbox which game or experience gives you sebastian Borgia, the most fun or pleasure on the sandbox that's my first question. Can you answer that? Maybe you. That's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, I um, first like I try to play uh, everything that comes out, and if you follow me on social media, you can actually see those tiny uh, two-minute-long video where I try. Uh, very often, I fail actually to finish or jump and, and do the hard challenges, but but I keep improving. Um, I really love recently the Lacoste experience. I love uh, some more uh, casual party games like uh, uh, After Ocean by Fag Bros. Some of those actually receive awards. We gave awards to them during our um, first creator uh, global day in Hong Kong. I, I love the Metaverse uh, Pride Parade, for example. And each is different. So. We're not yet at this stage where like there's only one game that everyone loves and just keep playing like on the other, but it's like all those different experiences that you go exploring and that you come back the next day to the platform because you know there's something a bit different or new that you will try and that you can also earn rewards as you play uh, and engage with those communities. Okay. So um, it's almost like almost like game game mechanics or experience mechanics or journeys that are bubbling up that are working that other people are going, Hey, I want to try that. Or that that's where it kind of can get fun too. I think. Yeah. It's kind of yeah the, the map itself is a meta gameplay. Like you, you, and in that new version we're launching this week, we embedded the map directly within the game client. So you can travel through experiences with, without having to leave or go to the browser anymore. Okay. Amazing. Um, I, last question. I, I know you're a big gamer. You, 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 um, head of the the, game, the blockchain game alliance outside of gaming you you work and live crypto and web3 it like the, it must just be an absolute it must be amazing fun but also incredibly demanding how do you how do you relax how do you switch off what do you do when you have two hours to, to yourself that's not gaming well so you um... Usually I try to keep on the weekend, like off family time and just like other activity. I like to go biking. I love, I love uh, walking, hiking, the thing that like, just like make like you know, drain the energy uh, on the body rather than, rather than just uh, up there. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I think it's also good sometimes to, to just like, uh, uh, get some time to put your thoughts together, et cetera, take a bit of time off to disconnect and then recharge and then be back here. Uh, like, like sometimes things come up, better ID, new IDs, et cetera. And other than that, like I'm quite active on social media. People can reach me, act, uh, engage, ask questions, et cetera. And that's really useful actually, because I, I think it's so important to stay close to your community, to your creator. Uh, like, um, so having their feedback, even if it's bad, huh? if they tell us like that doesn't work, this is broken, like how do you fix this? It's very important as well. And we encourage all form of feedback for helping us to get better and improve. Awesome. Thank you. And that we might like Jeremy, we should get some land on the sandbox so we can talk to our community more. Um anyone who's listening, there's been quite a few questions. After the show, I'll do a write-up of this and you'll be able to I'll answer the questions that haven't been answered in the chat or maybe forward them to Sebastian. You can answer them on social media. Um, otherwise, yep. thank you. Um, it's been brilliant. Jeremy, anything to end with? This is, yeah, this has been great, Sebastian. Thanks so much for your time and energy. And and I, I definitely look forward to once you get this DAO fully rocking and rolling, maybe we can do another uh, another episode in a year or so out in the sandbox and uh, and kind of see what's happening from the inside out. 
But uh, thank you so much for your time. To the disruptors and curious minds that joined us today that may be new to the show, thanks for jumping in. You can check us out at thinkingonpaper.xyz. All of our shows will be up at, uh, on Spotify, wherever you can get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Um, Mark, you want to give a quick shout out to our to our book club listeners and tell them what's going on there? Oh, yeah, the book club. How could we forget the book club? So we've got the Thinking on Paper book club. It's um, each week we discuss the chapters or a book on emerging technology and culture. And you can join, go to thinkingonpaper.xyz, give us your email and you can be part of the book club. Um, and yeah, show will be up on the website too. So, oh yeah, and next week, we have, who do we have next week, Jeremy? We have an awesome guest again next week. It just keeps on rolling. So We do, we do. Neil Redding next week, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Brilliant. Neil Redding next week. Hey, Peter, thanks for the kind words. Uh, glad you joined us today. Um, yeah, keep, keep, keep on the lookout. Uh, stay disruptive and stay curious, my friends. We'll see you next. Oh, quick, quick little wrap. Sorry, Ripple. Our friends at Ripple, this wouldn't be possible without these guys. W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com, marketing's on-demand talent platform. Flex out in the fourth quarter. You got a project, build a website, a strategy, uh, a, 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 a piece of land in sandbox. They've got, uh, they've got some great people to jump in, including Mark and myself. Thanks to Daisy, Ray, and Ripple. We will see you next time, Disruptors Bye. and Curious Minds. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Jeremy, and everyone. And hopefully see you in the metaverse.